Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa muwala. We praise you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the heavens and the earth. The Maker and the Creator of this universe, a peace and, and peace and blessings upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we'll carry on with the Sira class, inshallah. Um, so just before we start, just quickly um, ask those who were here before uh, or the last few sessions, just to give us a reminder about or a recap about what we talked about um, in regards to the Sira. You want it from the beginning? Um, yeah, go on, just want to quickly. <coughs> yeah. First of all, just the importance of the seerah. Yeah. So, we obviously, we do it for the sake of Allah and um, to learn about the Prophet and so the uh, obligation of Allah to learn uh, about the Prophet's life. It shows us um, when you read the Quran, it's, you need the hadith and the seerah to um, exp explain the Quran. Yeah. Um, so it, uh, it helps you understand the Quran better. Then after that, I think it was uh, the, the other prophets, so they came down with the same message. So but the relationship between the message of Muhammad وسلم, and the previous messengers, yeah? Yeah. And um, it was the same message of Tawheed, but it's just different sh uh, Sharia. Yeah. And then after that, it's the Arabian <coughs> Peninsula. So how times were like in Arab, um, not Arab, in the Arabian Peninsula. Yeah. Um, let's see. Now we spoke about how idol worshipping came into existence. Yeah. yeah? How times up there were times of death here, so people were spending their daughters alive. Um, the basic known would they would treat their women like uh, property. Yeah. The morals and values there was. Not good and do on uh, as well. Um, and then it talks about the year of the year of the elephants, which was the year of yeah. So the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi And then we spoke about obviously his family. You know, his dad died before he was born. He was born as an orphan. We spoke about his mother Amna Halima Saadiyah. She took him to the tribe of Banu Saad. Then the incident that happened to him, and then. His mother died. <coughs> excuse me, when he was six, uh, at the age of six, and then his grandfather Abdul Muttalib took care of him after, and he died at the age of when the messenger was eight. And then who took care of him after? Yeah, Abu Talib, his uncle Abu Talib. And obviously, we talked about when he was a teenager, he was a shepherd, and then he walked, he worked for Khadija, radiAllahu anha. It talks about when the servants of Khadija. Who remembers his name? My Sarah, yeah, when he used to go with him and he used to see a lot of things happening and he used to report back to Khadija radiallahu anha and then his marriage to Khadija and we spoke about when he became a prophet at the age of 40 how Khadija was the right wife for him at that time and how she comforted him and she was there for him, she supported him and even Abu Talib and then we mentioned lately, we mentioned uh, about the year when Khadija and Abu Talib died so what, what, do, what do they call that year? Yeah, or Amu, Amu al-Huzn, yeah, the year of sorrow. So basically he lost two of his, two of the closest people to him, which is Khadija. And what did we say, how, what was the, the time between Khadija after she died and Abu Talib, according to one of the narrations? One month and five days. Yeah, it's one month and five days. There are other narrations, obviously, but because it's like I said, it's, it's okay in the seerah to find sometimes different opinions and different narrations as long as it's nothing to do with the aqeedah, with the belief in Allah and stuff. So it doesn't matter, you know, that's the main thing. But you wouldn't, anyway, you wouldn't find something, differences of opinions in regards to believing in Allah or something like that, you wouldn't. Because those things sometimes, the all the narrations in, in terms of the seerah, for example, or even the stories of the prophets and stuff, Sometimes, some of them, a lot of the scholars, they say, they may not be correct 100%. However, sometimes they say, you cannot say it's not correct 100%, so you cannot say it's correct 100%, certain things. You cannot deny it, you cannot, you know, take it. So it's in between, but the main thing, because those things, they have no connection in terms of believing in Allah, or how, you know, the, the pillars of Iman, or the pillars of Islam. So, yeah. 
So anyway, so one of the narrations is one month and five days after Khadija died, Abu Talib died, and then that's the year of Amul Hussein or year of sorrow. So then, what did we speak about that? What was the topic after that? Yeah. Um, the, yeah, the meeting with a group of people, yeah. leaders there, and he was telling them about Islam, but they rejected it. And he said, um, "Why that happened in this meeting? Can we keep it between us?" Yeah. So they yeah. told their, I don't know, their servants, their slaves, and they attacked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I think um, it was they, <coughs> the servant, who was also trying to protect uh, the Prophet. Yeah. yeah. But they couldn't, so they ran away into the mountains. And the Prophet was behind the tree, and he said, "As long as Allah is happy with with me, then he's happy." Mashallah. Yeah. So basically, just um, to cover this briefly, quickly for those who are not here. So basically, what happened is, when Khadija died and Abdul Muttalib, that was such a, a huge incident in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As and as we discussed at the beginning of the seerah. All the incidents that happen to him, Allah is preparing him for what is major and what is more important than what happened before. So like we said, from an early age, Allah been preparing him. He was an orphan. His mother would die at the age of six. And then when he was eight, his grandfather dies. So all the people who are closer to him, or a lot of them, they died. And as he was still getting used to, to his mum because he spends quite a few years with Halima. He's getting back with his mum now, she dies. Now he's just starting to forget about his mum and getting used to his grandfather, his grandfather will die. So that, that will have an impact, like we said before, on any child. However, Allah is preparing Muhammad وسلم, from an early age. And then when Khadija died and Abu Talib, because Khadija, she was supporting the messenger وسلم, from day one. She was supporting him, comforting him, spending her money for the sake of Allah, the sake of the da'wah of Islam. And Abu Talib was protecting the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was, those were two of the pillars that he was leaning on all the time. So now they're gone. So there's so many lessons in that. Number one, that's a reminder to Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and a reminder to the Sahaba, and a reminder to all the Muslims until Allah will take this earth, meaning, the main thing for you is Allah. Even if the other pillars that you are relying on in this life goes, Allah is always there. Allah will make people, will bring you people to support you, to help you, but they might go one day, but Allah is always there. The support of Allah never stops. So that is, Allah is reminding Muhammad وسلم, and is teaching him a lesson, and even the Sahaba will learn from that. And we learn it from that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing him that Allah is what matters all the time. But obviously, as a human being, he was very sad because Khadija, she was his wife anyway. And he loved Khadija. And we mentioned what he used to say about Khadija after. So he used to say, Inni ruziqtu hubbaha. I have been granted the love of Khadija, radiallahu anha, even after the death of Khadija. And which, which one of his wives was um, jealous of Khadija? Yeah, Aisha radiallahu anha. So Aisha was more jealous of Khadija than any of the other wives who would live in with her same time. She was jealous more from Khadija radiallahu anha. And that shows the loyalty of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to his wife. He never forgets those who've been close to him, those who have been comforting him, supporting him, been there for him. He doesn't forget about them. And that's obviously, these are the characteristics of the Muslims. Someone has done favors for us, Somebody who's been there for us, comforting us, supporting us. We should never forget their favors, their support, them being there for us at that time of difficulty and calamity and hardship. We should always remember them and be loyal to them as well. So he used to speak about Khadija all the time. Even when he used to see the, the friend of Khadija, radiallahu anha, he used to sit because she was older. Because obviously we know that Khadija was older than him. So even the friend of Khadija, she was older. She was like around the same age, age as Khadija. So when he used to see the lady, he used to sit next to the lady, he said, she reminds me of Khadija. Subhanallah. So, um, so, and then Abu Talib died, and obviously, and then we, as we said before, the Prophet Sallallahu he tried harder with his uncle to, to announce the Shahada before he dies. 
to announce the shahada, but he didn't. Because of the Quraysh people, they say to him, are you going to leave the religion of your forefathers? Oh, Abu Talib, like the last minute. You've been following the same thing as us. And the last minute when you're about to die, you're going to change the religion of your forefathers? So that means bad company. They encourage you to go the wrong direction. And that's a lesson for all of us as well. So sometimes we'll have people there encouraging us to do what is the opposite of what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we please them, we are displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because to Allah, we shall return. So we should always remember that we're going to return to Allah. These people here, if they're pleased with us, they're not pleased with us, they're not pleased with us. It doesn't matter. As long as Allah is pleased with us, that's what matters. So that's what happened to Abu Talib. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Oh my uncle, just say, say the kalima, say the shahada I will intercede for you on the day of judgment Just say it But I didn't So that had such, such a huge, huge impact on the Prophet Sallallahu That's why he went to Ta'if Because as soon as Abu Talib died, the people of Quraysh started abusing Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Because before, they used to abuse his companions, some of his companions because Abu Talib was there to protect him. Because Abu Talib was one of, one of the leaders of the Quraysh. But after he died, he started abusing Muhammad Sallallahu personally now. And then one time, as I mentioned, Fatima radiallahu anha, he was praying next to the Kaaba, and they would come in, putting dust in his head and everything, and she was removing dust and all that from the head of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even Abu Bakr radiallahu anha, he said to them, أَتَقْتُلُونَ رَجُلًا يَقُولُ رَبِّي اللَّهِ You want to kill a man saying, Allah is my Lord? That's all he's doing. He's saying, Allah is my Lord. That's it. He's not doing anything to you. That's why you want to kill him. So, <clears throat> after that, the Ta'if, even little kids are throwing stones at him until he was bleeding and everything. The angels came to him. They said to him, if we want, we can demolish these two mountains here upon these people. He said, no. Allah may bring out of them someone, even one, someone who might worship him. And that was his main concern in this life is the da'wah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is conveying the message of Islam. Even if one person becomes a Muslim, that's what matters to him. And that shows you the mercy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa People are abusing him, torturing him, throwing stones at him, and still yet, he doesn't want to do that in return. He has the right to do that, to say to the angels, yes, demolish these two, these two mountains upon them. I am the messenger. I'm the, I'm, I'm, I'm the best person who walks on this earth. And he's doing this to me? But well, look at the mercy of Islam, the manners and the characteristics of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that shows you Islam is not the religion of killing and torturing people or you know doing injustice to others. That shows you Islam is a religion of mercy, of peace, of love. You only defend yourself. That's it. So, so then Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he's getting abused now. He's getting tortured. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward him in a different way. And like we said, after difficulty comes ease. Inna ma'al usri yusra. After difficulty comes ease. And we will, and we, well, we, we've been seeing that, and we will see that throughout the sunnah of the, uh, the seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we will see that Allah is bringing ease to him all the time. Allah is bringing, after a difficult moment, after a hardship, after a calamity, ease will come. Because Allah has granted him one of the best miracles, one of the best blessings is the night journey of Isra and Mi'raj. Immediately after Khadija died and Abu Talib and what happened to him in Ta'if, Allah is rewarding him now. See, the reward from Allah comes sooner or later. And that's, that's for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for his companions, but also for us as the followers of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we should always remember that ease will come sooner or later. Even if we're going through hardships and calamities and difficult times, we should always wait for that ease to come. And they say, the more the difficulty is becoming more harder and difficult, the closer the ease is. The closer ease is coming to you. The more difficult the situation becomes, the closer the ease will be to coming to you. SubhanAllah. But see, this is something, to be honest with you, it's something that sometimes we have to be aware of it and sometimes that we have to ponder upon and think upon it. Look, SubhanAllah, 
Khadija died, Abu Talib, the incidents of Ta'if, you know, and everything. He's now, it's just time of struggle, time of sadness. But Allah is rewarding him. And look at the reward. He's going to lead the Salah, so not the night journey. And there is the Surah, Subhanallah, Asra bi abdihi laylan min al al haram al majd al ladi barakna hawlahu li nuriyahu min ayatina. To show him from his side the signs of Allah. To show him the signs of Allah. Because people used to travel. It was such a lot, about a month traveling from Mecca all the way to Jerusalem, to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. But he went in one night, not even the whole night, you know? He went on a journey, and he went to the heavens, and he came back. SubhanAllah. And what happens? He's going to lead the Salah in Jerusalem, in Masjid Al-Aqsa, with all the messengers, and he's the leader. SubhanAllah. What a, what a reward from Allah. Can you just imagine... Because to be honest with you, sometimes if we think and ponder, then we feel how amazing this is. Him leading the salah, just think about the messengers. Think about Ibrahim alayhi salam. We hear about the story of Ibrahim, Musa alayhi salam, Isa, you know, Ismail, Yusuf alayhi salam, Ya'qub. Let's look at this messenger, Nuh alayhi salam, and imagine he's the leader of all of them. He's the leader, subhanAllah. He's the messengers of Allah and the prophets, and he is the leader. What a reward. What can you ask? What more could you ask for in a way? See, the reward from Allah. Allah is showing him, I'm here all the time. My support is here all the time. Khadija died, Abu Talib died. Whatever died, whatever goes, happens. I am here for you, O Muhammad. You know? And my reward is the greatest reward. And ease will come to you sooner or later. And that's a lesson for Muhammad, for the companions, for all the Muslims to learn. The ease will come and the reward from Allah will come. Sometimes it will come in this dunya or Allah will save it for the akhirah, for the day of judgment. That's how a believer thinks. Always remembers that Allah, if you are patient, you are satisfied with the decree of Allah, Allah will bring ease to you and Allah will bring, give you the reward. If the reward, sometimes Allah will give you a reward in this dunya, but you don't feel that reward in this dunya. You don't see it as a reward. But that is the that is, excuse me that is the reward, but we don't see it as a reward. We don't see, but the major reward is the one in the akhirah. And all of us on the day of judgment, we will be hoping that Allah has saved all our rewards for the akhirah, not in dunya. It's in the hadith like a human, a man will be saying, "Oh Allah, I wish you saved my reward for today. You haven't given me my reward in the dunya when I was alive." But we enjoy the reward in this dunya, of course, but for the akhirah, the reward will be immense, will be more important and much greater. So, <clears throat> so Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he was leading the salah in Jerusalem. So Angel Jibril came to him in this place in Mecca called Al-Hatim. So he took him. Where did we go? What were they riding to go to from uh, Mecca to Jerusalem? Yeah, al -Bura. That's the animal. It's basically, it's between a horse and a donkey. It's not a horse, it's not a donkey, so it's in between, but we call it al -Buraq. So they were riding the animal al -Buraq. So they went to Jerusalem. So Muhammad Sallam was the leader of all the prophets and all the messengers. So what happens? What happened after 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 the salah in um, in Jerusalem? To the yeah, he went to the heavens. So who did, who did he see in the first heaven? Yeah, Adam. So before them, the gatekeepers asked Jibril alayhi salam. So he said, "I'm Jibril." He said, "Who is with you?" He said, "Muhammad." He said, is, have you, "Has he been sent as a messenger? Has he been given his mission?" He said, "Yes." He said, "Welcome." So then he saw. Adam alayhi salam. And what did Adam alayhi salam say to him? Welcome a pious prophet and a pious son. Yeah. He says, welcome a pious prophet and a pious son. So this is Adam. And just imagine, yeah, he's going through the heavens and these are these prophets of Allah greeting him, welcoming him to the heavens. SubhanAllah. You know, honestly, what a reward. And what a human being, what a person. And that shows you He's the best human being who's been on this earth. You know, that's why he deserves all that.
Subhanallah. So Adam alayhi salam. So on the second one, who did he see? Isa alayhi salam. So what did Isa alayhi salam say to him? Was it Isa only or was it someone else with Isa? Yeah, it was Yahya and Isa, both of them. So it was Yahya and Isa, so they said to him, will come a... Yeah, so he said, will come a pious brother and a pious prophet. And then who did he see on the third heaven? What did he say about him? Yeah, and what did, what did Muhammad Sallallahu say about Yusuf? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so he said he has been given half of beauty. So Yusuf alayhi salam was extremely good looking. MashaAllah Mubarak. So yeah, so he said he has he has been given half of beauty. And then who did he see after? Idris alayhi salam. So he said the same to him, will come a pious prophet and a pious brother. And then who did he see after? Harun alayhi salam. So he greeted him the same the same way. And then who did he see after Harun? Musa alayhi salam, so he said the same thing to him, will come a pious prophet and a pious brother, and then the last one, Ibrahim alayhi salam, what did Ibrahim say to him? Yeah, because Ibrahim is the father of the prophets, yeah, so he said to him, will come a pious son and a pious prophet, so wh wh who did, what did he see Ibrahim, wh where was he sitting, Ibrahim? Yeah, al Bayt al Ma'mur, so in, in the heavens there is, like it's like a Kaaba, and the angels, 70,000 angels every day, they do tawaf and they go, they never return. New 70,000 angels, they come, they do tawaf and they go. So Ibrahim alayhi salam was sitting and leaning on al Bayt al-Ma'mur. And this is Ibrahim alayhi salam. So then, he went to, what's the, what do we call it? Sidratul Muntaha. Yeah, Sidratul yeah. So Jibreel alayhi salam is not allowed to go beyond. That's it. He's not allowed to go beyond that point. That's it. So it was only Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he went to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look, honestly, look at the rewards now. So look, from the beginning, leading the salah with all the messengers through the heavens, the gatekeepers opening the gates for him, the messengers are greeting him, and now he's going beyond even Jibreel alayhi wa sallam. He's going beyond to see Allah, the creator. So, when he came back, he was asked, did you see Allah? He said, Nurun anna ara. Ah, he's a light. I just saw light. How can I see Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Nurun anna ara. Alayhi salatu salam. So, and then he went to Musa alayhi salam. So what did Musa say to him? What did Allah order him to do? Salah. And then Musa alayhi salam, what did he say to him? Yeah, so so Allah ordered him to pray 50 times a day. So Musa alayhi salam said to him, Oh Muhammad, go back to Allah and ask him to reduce it because your nation will never be able to pray 50 times a day. They will not be able to do it. Because Musa alayhi salam, he had such an experience with the Bani Israel and he knew that that would be impossible for them to do. And like we said, now people, they struggle with five daily salahs, let alone 50, subhanAllah. So he went back to Allah, and Allah reduced it to 40. So he, he, Musa asked him again, he said, go back to Allah and ask him, they will never be able to do 40. He went back to Allah. So every time Allah was reducing it by 10, he got to 10. Allah, and Musa alayhi salam said to Muhammad alayhi salam, go back to Allah and ask him to reduce it, because your ummah, your nation will never be able to do 10 salahs a day. He went back to Allah, reduced it to 5. And even then, Musa alayhi salam said to Muhammad alayhi salam, go back to Allah and ask him to reduce it. And Muhammad sallam, was too shy and too embarrassed from Allah at that time to go because he reduced it all the way from 50 to 5. So I feel embarrassed now to go back to Allah and ask him to reduce it below 5. Meaning he reduced it more than enough. You know, Allah has so much mercy upon me and my ummah because he reduced the salah from 50 to 5. How can I go and ask him to reduce it anymore? So then... Obviously, Jibreel alayhi salam took him back on al-Buraq. And then in the morning, he was telling the, the Quraysh, telling them, the people of the Quraysh, and to them what happened to him the night before. So they started laughing about him. 
He told Abu Jahl, who is one of the leaders of the Quraysh and one of the leaders of the, the enemies of Islam. So he was laughing about Muhammad sallam. So he said to him, oh, if I gather the people of Mecca around you now, will you be able to say the same thing to them that you said to me? Muhammad sallam said, yes, of course. So he got all of them gathering around Muhammad sallam. So he told him, he told them what happened. He told them what happened. So then they all started clapping and whistling and could make meaning taking the mic out of Muhammad sallam. And when Abu Bakr وسلم, he met some of the people of Quraysh and Abu Bakr عنه, he haven't met Muhammad وسلم, by, by now. So he haven't met him for Muhammad to tell him what happened to him. So when they told Abu Bakr عنه, he said, have you heard what your friend was saying this morning happened to him last night? He said, what did he say? He said to him, this is what he said, meaning about the night journey and everything. He said, if he said it, then I believe him. See the Iman of Abu Bakr like we said, he had Iman, strong Iman in his heart. He would believe it. He said, if he said it, I believe it. He doesn't go question, how did it happen? When, where, this, he doesn't question. That's it, because he had that faith, because he knows, <coughs> he knows that everything that's coming to Muhammad وسلم, is a revelation from Allah. He doesn't question him anymore. That's it, he has that faith in his heart. And of course, there is a wisdom also by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why Khadija died, why Abu Talib died, and why Abu Bakr was still alive. You know? And why Umar, obviously Umar is not a Muslim by now, but why Umar, why Uthman, why Ali radiallahu anhu, why are these people going to stay with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They're not going to die before him. All this is a wisdom by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And why Abu Bakr is the closest person or the closest friend of Muhammad sallam is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So now, the Prophet sallam, Allah has ordered him to start inviting people to Islam. Now he's going to start inviting the tribes that come to pilgrimage in Mecca every year. He gonna, he's going to start inviting them and calling them to Islam. He's going to start preaching Islam to them. And even though he's doing that, but the people of Quraysh are still abusing him, still trying to stop him from his da'wah, from conveying the message of Allah. So he's going to start talking to some tribes. Some of them will ignore him. Some of them will not listen to him. Some of them, they will be influenced by the Quraysh. The Quraysh will influence them, say to them, don't listen to him. He's a crazy person. He's majnoon. He's a magician. He's that. He's this. He's that. So some people, they will ignore Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But some of them, some of them, they would listen to him. He found a group of people from Medina, from Al-Khazraj, because there's two tribes of the Arabs in Al-Medina, called Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj. So and we're going we're gonna to discover about Aws and Khazraj, because they used, they used to be enemies, these two tribes, Aws and Khazraj, before Islam, before they became Muslims, they were enemies. They had fights between them for more than, about 100 years or maybe more. But later on, we're going to see when they're going to become Muslims, how they're going to become brothers. How Islam brings people together. Subhanallah. Can you imagine? One century, they're fighting one another. They hate one another. But when they become Muslims, when Islam goes inside their hearts and Muhammad Sallallahu become their leader, their teacher, they're all going to have the love for one another. So there is a man called As'ad ibn, ibn Zurara. He was one, of, there were other men with him, one of them called Rafi ibn Malik, Ubad ibn Samit, he's one of the famous Sahaba as well. But As'ad ibn Zurara, this one's in particular, As'ad ibn Zurara, he's one of the leaders of that tribe, of Al-Khazraj, he's one of the leaders, As'ad ibn Zurara. So they listened to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. so he was saying to them about Islam, so there were about 12 of them, all together. So he said to them, can I talk to you? In the beginning, he sat next to them. He said, can I talk to you? They said, yeah. So then he started talking to them. He said to them, preaching to them and saying to them about, the, about Islam, and he's saying to them, meaning, do you want to plead allegiance to me on these conditions? So number one, he said to them, do not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he said to them, you do not steal from one another. 
And then he said to them, you do not commit zina, adultery. And then he said to them, you do not kill your children, your kids. And then he said to them, you do not spread rumors between one another. And then he said, you do not disobey my orders, my commandments. Meaning, on what is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, and whoever sticks to these conditions, his reward is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will reward him. And he said, and whatever happens to you, meaning something bad that happens to you in this life, meaning Allah is wiping out your sins. Meaning, he's trying to say to them, even if you become Muslims, if you become Muslims, Allah will reward you. And even if you become Muslims, and something happens to you, meaning Allah has decreed something, some, some harm to come to you, that means you don't look at it, I became Muslim now and harm is coming to me, how is that good? I thought a reward will come to me, not the opposite. But it's me saying to them from the beginning, saying to them that means Allah is wiping out your sins. Allah is bringing you closer. Allah is raising your status. Because you were not believers before. You were associating partners with Allah, worshipping idols and everything. That's why when a, Muslim, when a person becomes a Muslim, immediately after he becomes a Muslim, Allah does wipe out all his sins and he turns them into good deeds. Subhanallah. Can you imagine someone who lives who lived 70 years? All his life is committing sins. All his life is associating partners with Allah. All his life doesn't believe in Allah. And this is 70 years. But the day he becomes a Muslim, Allah will turn all those bad deeds into good deeds. Subhanallah. More, more, it could be more than a person who's been 70 years worshipping. And look at the mercy of Allah. Subhanallah. So, <clears throat> so then, Ubad ibn Samit, and this is in the, in the Bukhari. So As'ad ibn Zurara, remember, he's one of the leaders of al Khazraj. As'ad ibn Zurara. So there were about 12 of them. And among them was Ubad ibn Samit. He's one of the famous companions as well, one of the famous Sahaba. But this narration here is Ubad ibn Samit narrating this. On the Bukhari. So then Ubad ibn Samit said, after we, we were sitting there listening to him, then we became Muslims. We plead allegiance to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then when they were about to leave to go back to Medina, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent with them one of the companions. And he has specifically chosen that person or that particular companion to go with them. To teach them about Islam. Because now, it's 12 of them, but they're going to go back to their families now. To their wives, their families. So they're going to need to teach them about Islam. And they're going to be, they're going to need to be taught about Islam as well. Because now they just became Muslims. They don't know nothing about Islam. So he has chosen, who is the first ambassador in Islam, who is Mus'ab ibn Umar. Mus'ab ibn Umar, who is the first ambassador in Islam. And Musa ibn Umayr, before he was a Muslim, he was very he was he was very good looking anyway, but he used to dress up nicely and smartly all the time. He always looked smart. He has to wear the best and the nicest clothing among all the people. He used to look very good, very well presented to people. And that's one of the reasons why Muhammad Sallam has chosen him as well. Obviously, because he had the knowledge, but also because sometimes a person who is giving da'wah, conveying the message, they need to be good looking and they need to be dressed up nicely, looking nice. So even when they go to talk to people to present Islam to them, people don't, let, don't look down on them because of their appearances. So that's why Muhammad Sallam has chosen Mus'ab ibn Umayr. And Mus'ab radiallahu anhu, when he became a Muslim, radiallahu anhu, he left a lot of his luxurious life behind. He left a lot of it. He didn't take much of him because his tribe were not Muslims. So his tribe went against him, obviously. But he decided to leave everything behind and follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when they went to um, Medina now, and now just I want you to link something to what is coming. To what is coming, inshallah. Because now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he's still in Mecca. Okay, he is still in Mecca. So this is before he migrated to Medina. And what year did Khadija and Abu Talib died? Which year, I mean, after he became a prophet? 
Yeah, so 10 years, yeah? So who remembers how long he lived? So how long he lived after he became a prophet? 23, yeah? So now, how long he lived in Mecca after he became a prophet? Until Khadija and Abu, and Abu Talib died? 10 years, yeah? So 23, so take 10, how many years left? 13. Who knows how many years he spent in Medina? Okay, so yeah, so now we're going to come to that. But I just, what I want you to link now, link these people here who came to Mecca to pilgrimage, they listened to the Messenger of Allah, they became Muslims, they're going to go back to Medina, to their families, with Mus'ab ibn Umar, who's going to go and teach them about Islam and everything. So now, we need to start looking to the migration now. But look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making plans for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in advance. See, Allah is preparing Medina to host Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to welcome Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. See the plans of Allah all the time. Allah is planning for his messenger. Allah is making, bringing ease to the life of his messenger. See? So people becoming Muslims. So when he goes to Medina, there are already Muslims. Because if he goes before there's no Muslims there, it would be the same maybe as when he went to Ta'if. He would kick him out. He would abuse him, torture him. But Allah is preparing now Medina for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Musa ibn Umayr, anhu, he went with them to Medina and he started teaching them about Islam, teaching them the Quran and everything. So, obviously some of their families became Muslims, their wives, kids became Muslims and everything. So he's sitting with them and then two of the, two of the other people, no, they're not Muslims now, two people, they saw them and they saw Musa Anhu, sitting with them and teaching them about Islam. So, they thought, let's go and see what they're talking about. So they went there, they were listening to Mus'ab, Anhu. they left, and then after, so there was two people, Sa'd ibn Mu'ad and Usaid ibn Hudayr. And Sa'd ibn Mu'ad is one of the leaders of al Khazraj as well. So As'ad ibn Zurara, who became Muslim in Mecca, He's one of the leaders, and Sa'd ibn Mu'ad is one of the leaders of Al Khazraj too. And he was with another person called Usaid ibn Hudayr. So now, after they listened to Musa, they went, and then another time they saw him. So Sa'd said to Usaid, You know what? Go to him and say to him to stop preaching to them. So Sad stayed a bit far away, Usaid ibn Hudayr went to them. So he said to Mus'ab, what are you teaching them? What's this meaning? What's, what's this silly thing you're talking about? You're teaching these people here. So subhanAllah, Mus'ab, he was a wise man, and even As'ad ibn Zurara. Because As'ad ibn Zurara, as soon as they, came, they went to Medina from Mecca when he became Muslim, as soon as he went to Medina, he went to his people, to his tribe, and they all became Muslim immediately. All of them. So now, and the wisdom of As'ad ibn Zurara, because now, subhanAllah, you see, now the importance of using people from that village or that tribe to lead you to your, to your mission. Because they are the ones who, knows, who know the ins and outs. They are the ones who know the leaders of the tribe or the village or the city or the place. So As'ad ibn Zurara now, in a way, he's the guide for Islam. Now he's trying to attract the leaders because, when, because at that time, at that time, when a leader of a tribe or a village becomes a Muslim, the whole tribe will follow him because the tribe will follow the leader of the tribe. That's why they were trying to target the leaders so if the leader, so Sa'd ibn Mu'ad was one of the leaders, meaning if Sa'd ibn Mu'ad becomes a Muslim, all the tribe of Sa'd ibn Mu'ad will become Muslim. <coughs> so then Usaid, <coughs> excuse me, Sa Usaid asked, what's this, this, that? And then Mus'ad radiallahu anhu and Sa'd ibn Zurara said, As ibn Zurara said to him, you know what, what about this? They were very wise. So what about this? 
What about you sitting down, listening to what I'm saying? This meaning you've got nothing to lose. Listen to it. If you like it, I mean, they said in the beginning, if you don't like it, if you don't like what you're hearing, that's fine. You don't have to follow it. No problem. If you like it, then good. So meaning you've got nothing to lose. So sit down and listen first. Why are you having that negative mindset from the beginning? You're rejecting something before even you're listening to it, before even you know what it is. So they were very wise. So he was listening, and then he said, wow, he said, but Allah, this must be the truth. This must be a message of a messenger. And he became Muslim immediately. He said to Musa, he said, what do I need to do now if I want to become a Muslim, if I want to follow your religion, what do I need to do? He said, all you need to do, go and wash, meaning purify yourself, purify your clothes, and pray to rakaz to Allah. That's it, that's all you have to do. So he said to them, well, you know what? Let's speak to Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, because he's one of the leaders, meaning if he becomes a Muslim, the whole tribe will follow him. Then they went to Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. Now Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad and Usaid ibn Hudad, they were friends. Now Usaid ibn Hudad, because he was sitting with them and Sa'ad, say for example, he's sitting there, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, he doesn't know. He doesn't know Usaid, he became Muslim now. Because he was away. He was sitting far from them. So they come into him now. They went to Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, and then they started speaking to him. They started telling him about Islam, and then he became a Muslim. Subhanallah. He said, I want to follow this religion. And he became a Muslim. And now Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is putting the nur of Islam in Medina. See the beginning now, beginning stages. Before Muhammad migrates from Mecca to Medina, Allah is putting the nur of Islam in Medina to welcome Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and to be a suitable place for his messenger and for his da'wah. Because the land needs to be pure. And there has to be the nur of Allah in there, subhanAllah. And a lot of the scholars, when they speak about this, they say, subhanAllah, Allah makes his messenger goes to places that has the nur of Allah in them. They are suitable to host Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So yeah, so now Mecca, is, Medina, sorry, is preparing for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Sa'd ibn Mu'ad went to his tribe now. And he said to them, that meaning my family, everything is haram for me if you don't follow me. Meaning, I'm not one of you anymore. I'm not one of you anymore. I follow the religion of Allah now. I follow Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you follow me, then that's it. Meaning we are together then. If not, I'm not one of you. But all of them, immediately, they became Muslims. All of them. The tribe of Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, radiallahu anhu wa arda. And we're going to see after what's going to happen to Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, radiallahu anhu. You know? Subhanallah. And in the meantime, <clears throat> the Prophet Sallallahu he carried on giving da'wah to other people who used to come, who used to, come to, to, to Mecca, other tribes and everything. So after one year, after one year, because the Prophet Sallallahu sent Mus'ab to stay with them in Medina, in the beginning, those 12 people who became Muslims, he sent Mus'ab, like I said, the first ambassador in Islam, he sends them, he sends him with them. And then the next, the next, next year, the next pilgrimage, because they come every year. The next pilgrimage, they're going to come to Mecca, and Musa obviously going to come back with them. So the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So in the beginning, remember, how many of them became Muslim first in the Medina? Twelve. Twelve of them, yeah. Now, when they go back to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in, in Mecca, in pilgrimage, now they are 73. 73 men and two women. So imagine from 12, the wins up to 75 altogether. So 73 men and two women. <coughs> so they went in one place, one of the mountains by Mecca, and they were waiting for the Prophet So he came to him, he came to them, and they said, we're going to plead allegiance to you. 
O Muhammad وسلم, so they're going to pay allegiance to him to me to say meaning to say that we are becoming Muslims and we are your followers now so they they became Muslims and now a lot of people in Mecca and especially the Quraysh when they they start hearing like people in a meaning at Medina which is a different city now they're gonna start worrying they're gonna start worrying now they're gonna start being concerned because meaning people are even because this they 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 they're trying to stop him from his da'wah. They're trying to restrict his da'wah. They're trying to make people ignore the da'wah of Muhammad Sallallahu not becoming Muslims. But now, it's get, meaning it's getting out of control because people outside Mecca that they cannot control are becoming Muslims. But obviously, this is happening by the permission of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. You know? So these, so these people, so they will obviously they will go back to 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 Medina, um, to their to their people and everything. So basically, there are a lot of lessons to learn from this. So number one, like I said, is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is preparing Medina for Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam before he migrates from Mecca to Medina. Allah is preparing the Medina for him. And the other thing is the wisdom that should be used by someone who is inviting others to Islam, like Musa ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu. He was very well presented, and plus he was very wise in his da'wah. And the example that we've We've, we've, we've discussed when Usaid ibn Hudar went to him and Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, the way he spoke to Usaid ibn Hudar and everything, that means there's wisdom. Because if he didn't say to him, you have nothing to lose, just sit down and listen to the message. If you don't like it, no problem. If you like it, then fine. Otherwise, if he didn't have that wisdom that Allah has given him, he could have said to him, what's wrong with you? He could have fighted with him. He could have said, well, what's wrong with you? We are preaching our religion. You don't follow the same religion, so go away, for example. But he had the wisdom. So always wisdom in the da'wah to the religion of Allah is very important. And the other thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who plans everything because as much as the Quraysh is planning and plotting against the messenger of Allah, as much as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bringing ease and making other ways, you know, for Muhammad sallam and bringing more people to Islam from different ways. Meaning, if you try to stop the Meccan, the Meccan people to become Muslims, Allah saying, okay, I'm going to make people outside Mecca Muslims that you can't even control. Go and challenge me then. Go and stop those people from Medina from becoming Muslims. So that shows the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what works all the time. And that shows Islam, again, is not the religion of killing, not the religion of fighting, not the religion of torturing people, abusing people. That shows these people here, they became Muslims by their own choice. They were not forced by Muhammad وسلم, or his companions or anyone to become Muslims. They had that choice. They decided to become Muslims. They listened to Muhammad and they said, yes, we'll follow you. The same as those who listened to Mus'ab ibn Umayr, you know, like Asad, uh, like uh, Saad ibn Mu'ad, and then he went to his tribe, Sa'ad ibn Hudayr. He never forced them. So that is something for us to learn also, because there are a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of stigma attached to the Islamic message or the, the message of Muhammad Sallam, that Muhammad Sallam was spreading the message by killing people, by torturing people, by oppressing people to become Muslims. And that's not true. You can see here, people, they are choosing to become Muslims. They have their own, they made their own choice. So it's very important for us and to remember these examples in particular because sometimes you need to use these kind of examples to show that there are a lot of people there, well, majority of people became Muslims, you know, by their own choice. No one forced them. Muhammad Sallallahu doesn't oppress people to become Muslims, you know. So that's very important for us to remember. So I'm going to stop here inshallah um next time obviously we're going to start talking about the migration from mecca to medina hijra so just remember just we need to make the link always now between these few things that happened now with the migration from mecca to medina inshallah 
So we'll stop here. If you have any questions or you want to mention anything, inshallah, feel free. Thank you. Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa sallam ala al-mursaleen, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi wa sallam.